Aloha. I mean, uh, good morning. Hang loose, people. Hang loose. Uh, some of you know I was on vacation last week in Hawaii, and it was a great vacation, and I'm glad to be home. So good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship again at the church on the hill, either in person or online. We're so glad that you are here. In the building, there are black pads at the ends of the roads. We take just a minute and let us know that you are present and perhaps give us a contact email so that we can do our part to stay connected with you. And if you're worshiping online, say hello in the comment section or you can go to nwumc.com slash connect. It is a great day to be in the community of faith. It's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to be together. We are going to celebrate the sacrament of baptism this morning. And throughout the whole service, we're going to continue to stand on the promises of our faith, which happens to be our opening hymn. So in body or in spirit, please stand and we'll sing together. in your bulletin, please note that the bulletin can also be found at nwumc.com slash connect for those who are worshiping with us online. Here are some highlights. If you're looking for an opportunity to get involved in helping our neighbors, check out the sign-up sheets in the hall to see how you can help. We will, we will be preparing a dinner for Mana Cafe this Wednesday, October 12th. 
Volunteers are needed to donate, prepare, and distribute the meal in to-go containers at Broad Street UMC. On Friday, October 14th, we'll be packing brown bag lunches. Helping hands and donations of food items are always welcome. <coughs> And we will be providing and serving breakfast for the Church for All People on Sunday, October 23rd. Sign-up sheets are in the hall, and more information about these and other opportunities to serve can be found in the Northwest Happenings email. If you would like to give to Hurricane Relief, you can give to UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, by writing a check to Northwest UMC with Hurricane Relief in the memo line. You can find more information in this week's email. Have you registered for the basketball tournament yet? Join us on Saturday, October 22nd, starting at 9 a.m. in the Ministry Center for some 5-on-5 fun for a great cause, our 2023 summer mission trip. Full details and a link to the registration form can be found on our website, nwumc.com slash basketball tournament. Is there a specific church ministry or project that you would like to support? Or would you like to invest in the future work of our church? The Living Legacy Partners would like, would like to help you learn more about that. Please take a look at their new brochure, which can be found in the hymnal racks of each pew or on the table in the hall. And now we'll hear about some upcoming music opportunities from Brian Luke. Good morning, I'm Brian Luke. I'm the choir director and organist here. And we're gonna talk about Christmas. Does it seem early? No, it's late. <laughs> Christmas starts after Labor Day. I learned that at Target and Walmart. <laughs> but before we talk about Christmas, when we sing Amazing Grace a little bit later this morning after the prayer time, you get to join in and sing with us. The choir has a, an arrangement of Amazing Grace with two verses that you're encouraged to join in, and you'll know when it's time for you to sing because the words will be on the screen. You could actually sing the whole thing with us if you want. In fact, any week you could sing with us as you want. You can just make up stuff from the congregation. Everybody likes that except the neighbor sitting right next to you. Uh, so that's Amazing Grace later. For Christmas, the choir is doing a work called Glad Tidings of Great Joy, and we're going to perform this on December 18th at the 930 service. December 18th, one week before Christmas. That gives us maximum time to rehearse. <laughs> so everybody's welcome to join that choir. You don't have to be in the choir on a weekly basis to sing in the Christmas choir. We practice on Wednesday nights from 7.20 to 8 o'clock, and we have a little prayer time at 8 o'clock, and then uh, if you're not in the weekly choir, then you're dismissed, and, and um, uh, the, the rest of the choir goes on to prepare for Sunday mornings. But anybody can join this choir. Um, you don't even really need to know how to sing, because we will, we will teach you that. <laughs> and we have a lot of fun, and then we get to do a great work on uh, December 18th. This particular work is beautiful, it has powerful narration, and it's accompanied by organ and harp. So it'll be, it'll be a beautiful experience. Another way that you can get involved with Christmas is the children's choir. Now, the Children's Choir meets every week in the music room right around the corner there from 10.30 to 11, and we're starting that today. And uh, that's open to kindergarten through fifth grade. It's directed by myself and my wife, Barbara Luke, and we have a lot of fun. If we say kindergarten through fifth grade, by the time they reach fifth grade, um, they still have a lot of fun, but they feel like they're not supposed to anymore like they're too old to have that much fun. So we try to get the fifth graders, but really it's like K through four. And uh, we, we sing a lot, we, they learn how to sing in between all the fun that we have. That's every week, and those kids will be preparing for Christmas, and we are also approaching it um, where they don't have to be there every single week to be prepared. So you, you don't have to think, oh, I can't make it every Sunday, so I can't be in it. We make sure they have materials in their hands and uh, something to listen to at home so they can learn it, even if they're only here every other week. Um, the other thing is, when we do the pageant, 
which is Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock across the hall, uh, preschoolers are welcome too. They don't come and meet with us every Sunday morning to learn how to sing. They just dress up in costumes. And it's super fun because I just ask them, what do you want to be? And they say, I want to be an angel. And I'm like, I think it'll be good for your parents to see you as an angel one day a year. <laughs> you know, or sometimes they say, I want to be a giraffe. I'm like, I don't think there are giraffes at the manger. That's what I used to say. And now I'm like, you can be a giraffe. You know, whatever they want. I, I want to be a snake. Well, there were probably snakes there. I want to be a bat. So the preschoolers, it's very easy for them. They just get dressed up, and then we sort of position them. And it's great. So that's, that's the other way, is the children's choir, either Sunday mornings, 10, 30, 11, or if you're interested in, in being involved as a preschooler, you can contact me or, or Dora Singh, our family director. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. And all of this is God's gift, given to us without price. At this time, I would like for the Holman and the Penny families to come forward as they are presenting children for baptism. And I've asked Pastor Chris to help me, and so he's washing his hands. And so if, if the children scream or cry, it, blame him. <laughs> but if you'll come forward, I have questions to ask you, and I've asked their sponsors to come forward as well. I want you all to know that this is Emmett Homan, and this is Lily Penny and Maddie Penny. And I'm going to ask Kavon and John Christian to come forward as well, because they're going to help me with Emmett's baptism. Thank you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, parents and sponsors, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and depression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, if so, say, I do. And this is directed to the sponsors. Will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly and to lead a Christian life, if so say, I will. Come on, John Christian. Lily, Lily, will you help me? Okay. Now, this is just ordinary water. Ordinary water. Lily's already put her hands in it to make sure that it's okay water. Again, come on, and John Christian, I'm going to put your hands in this water. Lily, do it again. Can you do this? See, see if it feels kind of wet, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a little wet, but it's not too cold. Right. But we, as a church, even though this is ordinary water, we are going to pray over it and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to use this water as a means of grace to help children know that they are special and claimed by God. Okay? So let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of this water and for the gift of children. We give you thanks for the gift of families, especially these who present their children today 
for the sacrament of baptism. We know throughout salvation history, you have used water to save your people. And so we remember all of that today. And we claim your spirit upon us and upon these children that they may grow up in the faith and become the children that you intend. Amen. Okay, Pastor Chris, I'm going to ask you to take Emmett and then we're going to bring him over here. And come on, and John Christian, you're going to help me baptize him. How beautiful. Now, you all need to know that Emmett is wearing his mother-in-law's wedding dress that has been remade into his baptismal attire. I also want you to know that both of these families are very special to me. I happen to be the officiant at each of their weddings and had the privilege of baptizing Lily as well. You all need to get in front of me because we're going to do this together, boys. Okay. Ready? All right, we're going to put this on his head. Can you do that? All right. You're safe. Ready? Here we go. Emmett, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good for him. And Lily, will you help us as we baptize Maddie? Pastor Chris is coming. Now, and Maddie is wearing the same baptismal gown that her sister wore a couple of years ago, except a different size. So that's a special part of that. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. All right, ready? Maddie, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It gets better, I promise. I promise. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Baptism hurts sometimes. Oh, I messed up her hair. <laughs> will you respond to these families with the words that will be on the screens? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Emmett and Madeline with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for Emmett and Madeline that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Amen. We always are fascinated by our stained glass. After worship, I'm sure that they will... Families will be out in the area beyond the back doors, just beyond the media booth, and they will receive your welcome. Let's give them a big hand.
just want to point out that she had calmed down. I had calmed her down before Mabin laid hands on her. So, whose fault really? Who can say? As we come to our time of prayer this morning, please hear this good news story. A seven-year-old boy in Indiana is donating his entire piggy bank to help those in need in Florida in the wake of Hurricane Ian. Proud mom Jacqueline DeAndrea posted a video of her son Dominic on, to social media and wrote, my seven-year-old Dominic learned what is happening in Florida and ran outside with his piggy bank. He said, mommy, people will need this more than me. I want to help them. My heart is so happy to call this young man my son. As a reminder, if you would like to follow Dominic's example and give to UMCOR relief efforts in Florida, uh, that's the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief, you can give online through the West Ohio Conference website. You can write a check made payable to the West Ohio Conference and mail that into them. Or you can give to Northwest Church and put hurricane relief in the memo line and we'll make sure that gets to to encore for you, and we can support the people in Florida following Hurricane Ian. So we give thanks for all the good that God continues to do in the world through ordinary people like you and me and seven-year-old Dominic. I'm always reminded of uh, a line I once read in a book by Harold Kushner that uh, hurricanes and natural disasters and earthquakes and those kinds of things those are not acts of God. But the people who come together to help afterwards and flood the community with love, that's an act of God. Thanks be to God. We want to continue to pray for peace all over our world, for all of those affected by violence and war. And of course, we continue to pray for those affected by Hurricane Ian and natural disasters and weather events around our world. We pray for the families of those who were killed in the Thailand shooting at the daycare this past week. From our local congregation, please know that Linda Deal has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. She had a mild cardiac event on Thursday and she is recovering. Please uh, continue to pray for Linda. Vicki Boer has been diagnosed with blood clots in her left leg and appreciates your prayers. Bob Slee scheduled to have hip replacement surgery on Thursday, August, uh, October the 13th. Sorry, we're already in October. <laughs> and uh, so keep Bob in your prayers as he goes in to have that surgery. Of course, we give praise for the baptisms of Emmett Homan and Madeline Penny this morning, and we pray for their families as they continue to raise them in the faith. And the white rose on the altar is in memory of Harold Howison. Uh, we just learned this week that Harold passed away on September the 16th. He and his wife, Joan, have been members here for many years, even maintaining their membership after moving to Nashville seven years ago. And some of you may remember Harold as the last surviving member of the Honeydoers, a group of men who met weekly to help repair and maintain our building. So let's remember Joan and their family in our prayers this morning. Of course, we want to continue to pray for all of those on our prayer chain list, as well as those in military missionary service and their families, for all of those dealing with difficult uh, financial situations, those struggling with various health issues, those who are in transition in relationships, those who struggle with the disease of addiction, those who struggle with loneliness and depression, all who are grieving, and all of those worldwide who continue to be martyred and oppressed for being who they are and believing as they do. If you have a prayer concern or a joy to share with us this morning, if you're in the building, you can fill out one of the uh, cards located in the pews in front of you. There are prayer cards, and you can fill those out and drop those in the box on your way out of worship this morning. Um, and if you're worshiping with us online, you can go to nwumc.com slash connect and click on the request a prayer button. We would love to be in prayer with you throughout this week. Now at this time, let us be still and take a deep breath. Trust in the presence of the Holy Spirit and let us pray. 
gracious and loving God, maker of all that is and was and ever shall be, we come to you this morning as a community of faith, <coughs> mindful that you are present in and among us. You have poured out your Holy Spirit upon each one of us, O oh God, and you have inspired us through the breath divine. We remember, O oh God, that you have walked with us from before time began. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are our beginning and our end. You have known each one of us from before we were born, and you have continued to be our God all along the way, and will continue to be our God until we are rejoined together with you. O oh God, this day we celebrate your gift of baptism, the gift of your Holy Spirit that comes together with your community. Help us to remember that we are called as people of faith to help build up your children, to care for them, that we are not only called to raise our own blood children in the faith, but we are called to be a village, to come together and to care for all children, to teach them, to raise them, and to support their families all along the way. For it is not about us, O oh God. We are not called to be selfish, but to be selfless and to look to the interests of others. To be like Jesus who took little children onto his knee, even when the disciples wanted to turn them away, to care for them as our own. And so, God, we pray for these children this morning. We pray for children all around our world, that they would be raised up and surrounded by your love and your grace. We pray, God, for all people all around the world who live in fear of violence and war and ask that your peace would come into their lives. We pray for all of those who are struggling with various health issues that you would be a healing balm for them. We pray for those who feel lost, left out, and forgotten, that you would remind them your love follows them wherever they go and that they cannot be separated from it. We pray for all of those who have gone astray, that you would lead them back into your grace and along your calling. God, we also recognize that we too have fallen short of your glory. There are times when we sin and go off the path that you have set before us. Humble us, O oh God, forgive us, and bring us back into alignment with your will. Give us the same mind and spirit that was in Christ Jesus. Help us to follow in his example. For we remember this day all that he taught and all that he did among us here on this earth. And we strive to follow the commandments he left with us. We join together now in saying the words, the prayer that he taught us as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 38. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as, is, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to you, <clears throat> to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling of the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. Well, at that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to whom all were looking for the redemption of Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Church people, God love them. God love us. Let's admit it, most of the time we mean well. It's just that we don't always come across that way. I'll tell you, every month I get together with a group of clergy colleagues for lunch, and, and we compare notes about all sorts of things. Last month, we were telling stories about what we had observed in our churches or what church people had personally said to us that caused us pause. One colleague of a, a really small church shared that he overheard an usher say to new people, Welcome to our church. We're so glad you're here. Sit wherever you'd like. And then pointing said, except for that back pew, um, that's my family's place. <laughs> Talk about mixed messages. Another pastor was challenged by the choir director in front of the whole congregation. After the choir sang their anthem, she turned to the pulpit and shouted, Top that! preacher. And I actually can hear Brian Luke saying that. <laughs> and another colleague was greeting people in the back of worship when an older woman, who was trying to be constructive, said to her pastor, you blink too much when you preach. And you are also a very pale person. <laughs> I guess she thought that was helpful feedback, but you know what he said back to her? Thank you for your kind words. No kidding, no kidding. The same pastor of that small church was told, you know, you really should wear a bra when you preach. And the pastor was a man. And years ago, on a Pentecost Sunday, I wore red like some of us do on Pentecost, but I will never forget when Mary Jo, a woman about the age of my mother, came up to me and said, you know, I don't know where you were raised, 
But in this community, only prostitutes and children wear red shoes. All true stories. Church people, you gotta love them. God love us all. Look, it's no secret, all of us who choose to be church together really do try. We try to be helpful and kind to one another, but let's face it, we're a work in progress. And I can't imagine my life without us. A month or so ago, I posted a meme on my Facebook page that read, I'd rather attend church with messed up people who love God than religious people who dislike messed up people. Did you see it? If you agree, agree let me hear an amen. amen. If you're with, visiting with us this morning, please know we don't always get it right. But we love God. And we choose to love others, even when it's hard. Some of you know we just finished a message series called Just Like Us. We were looking at biblical characters that we don't often hear about to see what we could learn about God and each other through them. And, and as we move into a new series called Be the Church, I want us to actually look at two people in the life of Jesus, Simeon and Anna, who usually don't get mentioned much in the pulpit, except maybe on the Sunday after Christmas. Do you know their story? First of all, let me say that Luke, the gospel writer, is the only one who tells it. And as we know about his gospel, Luke continues to let us know that the people who know the most about God are usually the least likely we'd expect. The outsiders, the poor, the prostitutes, and the women. And that's helpful to know as we unpack today's story. Now Luke uses this particular story to connect to Jesus, to what has been promised by the Jewish scriptures. And he sees this moment and a new development in an old, old story. Mary and Joseph are committed to that story, which is why they go to the temple after Jesus was born. Like Christians who bring their children for baptism, Mary and Joseph were bringing their child to the temple for the ritual their religion prescribed. And it was there in the temple that we meet Simeon and Anna. But let me start with Simeon. Unfortunately, he was a man whom we know virtually nothing about, not his lineage not his status, not even his occupation. All we know is that he was a devout man and God had revealed it to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. How exactly did God reveal such a thing to Simeon? And, and how did Simeon know to believe it? We don't know. Yet we do get the impression he's been waiting on this revelation to come true for quite some time. You know, my imagination. I can't help but wonder if he was known as a person with this deep spiritual intuition and connection to God. Or just another religious nut. This is speculation on my part. But I've been wondering if the temple was really all that friendly to Simeon. I mean, Luke tells us that he was a nobody from nowhere, and he was convinced that he heard from God in this special way. What would you think? Because I have to confess, sometimes people who claim to have special revelations from God People who begin sentences with, God told me, make me suspect. I have to 
to wonder if Simeon got on people's nerves and if he made them uncomfortable. Maybe when the temple folks saw him coming, they said amongst themselves, oh no, here we go again. I imagine Simeon pestering the temple staff year after godless year. Is he here yet? Where's the Messiah? Has he come? Simeon reminds me of a, a church person who's kind of hard to take seriously. Like Stuart. A guy who showed up on a Sunday morning at a different church I served. <laughs> telling the staff that he had been kicked out of his last church and was looking for a new one. Interesting introduction, don't you think? <laughs> kicked out, I said. Well, kicked out of the choir, he clarified. And within weeks, we on the staff could see why. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Stuart had a great singing voice, but he had no social gravitas, no social ease. Namely, he didn't know how or when to keep his mouth shut like the church person who told his pastor that he was too pale. But I have to admit, Stuart came back to my mind as I thought about Simeon year after godless year. Did he ever give up? And, and though he was a, a nobody and maybe even a religious nut, I still give him credit because let's face it, when natural disasters continue to devastate our world, when we hear more about hate crimes and loneliness while church attendance flattens out, it's sometimes hard to trust that God is at work, that God is doing a new thing if we just continue to stand on the promises of our faith. But somehow, Simeon held on to that promise from God or else the promise held on to him. Let me say that again. Somehow Simeon held on to the promise from God, or else the promise held on to him. Until one day, until one day after a very long time of waiting, he developed an undeniable urge to head to the temple. And once he arrived, no one had to tell him that so had the Messiah. He just knew. Okay, enough about Simeon. Let's talk about Anna. Her lineage and occupation were more obvious than that of Simeon. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She may not have sung in the choir, she was a prophet. A prophet and a woman, which makes her kind of odd back then. She was an older woman who, who stayed in the temple night and day, and the text treats her neither as an outsider Neither her presence there or her work as a prophet is anything unusual or ordinary or out of the ordinary. It's hard to know. It's hard to know whether people in the temple hung on her every word or whether they merely tolerated her company. If I had to guess, it was some of both. In my imagination, she too, lacked some social graces, like a bull in a china shop, who spoke with such passion at times her listeners felt like she was condemning them. Like Mary Jo, who told me only prostitutes and little children wear red shoes. But Anna recognized in Jesus something very special, and she didn't hesitate to tell people about him. The text says she began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. 
In all her decades at the temple, she must have encountered thousands of infants brought by their parents to the temple for consecration. How did she know that this child, this Jesus child, was different? We don't know. What we do know is that Simeon and Anna weren't perfect people. That's just not Luke's style. They were flawed. Yet they were faithful people. Like us. Who could see in Jesus what others could not see. And even for a very brief time, Simeon and Anna were the community of faith for the infant king. Unlike others who would see Jesus in later years only as a threat to the status quo, a lawbreaker, a disruptor of the peace, Simeon and Anna, his community of faith, saw in Jesus the Christ. As Simeon said to the mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. He told Mary that Jesus would be a sign that would be opposed. Meanwhile, he kept his eyes fixed on Mary. If only he had kept his mouth shut. But he went on to tell her and a sword will pierce your own soul, too. Stuart, Simeon, what a thing to say to a baby's mother. Who wants to hear that? Even if it's true. That would be like me telling the pennies and the homans, those presenting children today for baptism, oh, you just wait. Today, you think you have perfect, innocent, and flawless children, but that'll change. There will be sleepless nights, trips to urgent care, maybe even to the police station. There will be broken curfews, broken trust, broken promises, and broken hearts. Though true, that's nothing I would say to you today or what you want to hear now. And the baptism is not always good news because the bad news in baptism is that it won't protect your children from illness or injury, heartburn or heartache. But here's the good news. You have a community of faith. You have a village in us. Perhaps you remember at your wedding after I asked your families to bless your marriage, I said to those who gathered, will all of you do whatever you can to support these two as individuals and as a couple? And they all said to you, we will. This community of faith will not be flawless, but we will be faithful. We will support you as we support one another if you let us. Look, there are no guarantees. Life will unfold. Things will happen, some good and some not so good. But as the church, we will continue to see Christ in you and in your children. We will choose to love one another, even when it's hard. I can testify to that personally. As many of you know, when my youngest children were 16 and 14, their father died suddenly. I was a fairly new pastor here. I had no extended family in Ohio back then. I worked every weekend. And my son Chris was a travel soccer player. Anybody other families have been involved in travel sports? There were many weekend tournaments that I just couldn't attend. But Lee and Josh Keller, 
parents of another soccer player and members here took Chris, my son, with them. They treated him as their own and they intentionally became his village. One of my favorite memories of that time was when Josh, the dad, told me that the boys had gotten out of line in public. I don't remember what they did, but Josh thought I needed to know. He also thought I needed to know that when Josh saw that happening, whatever that was, he thumped his son on the head. And then he thumped mine. I don't know if Josh were afraid Chris would complain or if he thought, I thought my son was perfect. I laughed and said, thank you. That is not to say we will thump each other on the head, as tempting as that might be on occasion. Please hear that. <laughs> but it is to say we are a part of each other's village. We're your village, and we're your village, and yours, and yours, and yours. We will be your people, and we will be your church, looking for Christ, even in you, and loving each other through good times and bad, even when it's hard. Church people, Simeon, Anna, Stuart, Mary Jo, God love them. God love us all. Amen. Amen. said it does take a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to raise us as well. Go in peace. Amen.